Okay, everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for July 18th. I'm Mac Rattle from Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me at uppercutwoodworks.com or on Twitter at Uppercut Wood. With me is Chris Wong. Hello. Where can people find you on the web, Chris? <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter at Flare Woodworks and my website, flarewoodworks.com. Cool, and our special guest tonight is the Wood Whisperer himself, Mark Spagnolo. What's up? Say hi, Mark. How's it going, everybody? Going very well. So thanks, everybody, for joining in. Um, we have a little agenda tonight. Talk to Mark, beat him up, make fun of Wood, Wood Talk Online Radio and the Guild <laughs> and things like that. Please do. Um, so really quick, you guys, around the horn, um, let's do some announcements. Um, next week, we'll have Matt Vanderlist on. Um, I wish my camera would stop autofocusing. That's pretty annoying for everybody. Um, Matt Vanderlis will be on next week, and next week we'll be at the same. We'll be back at a regular time, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific and um, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, and after that, we'll have uh, Shannon Rogers on. So, um, kind of back to the regular schedule with some with some Wood Talk Online guests. Um, Chris, you want to talk about what is on your bench and how your table's doing? Well, my bench is cleared off right now. I spent an hour cleaning it up. But this table that I've been working on for the past, actually, it's been four months, you know. <laughs> I've got finish on the table now. So it's probably one more day before it's complete. And I'm looking forward to that. What kind of finish are you using? I put the uh, general finishes um, in enduro bar on top of it. Cool. Spray, brush, pad? I regged it on. Used a... Uh, Cool. cool. What's, what species wood is the table? It's maple, a western maple. Okay, all right. Do you like the way the Endurovar looks on maple? Because it's supposed to have that uh, slightly more oil oil look to it, like a little yeah, bit of amber it, to it. It does, the ambering. I tested actually side by side with the Varathane oil based product, and they looked identical. And okay. that's what I was going for, so I went with it. And I like how there's less fumes. Mm -hmm. And it dries pretty quick for a. Oh, it does. Yeah, especially when you put on ragged, really thin coats. Yeah. Yeah, stuff's expensive. It's like eighty bucks a gallon, but I spray a lot of that of the satin. Oh, do you? Satin. So wait, I actually I glossed over that. So you actually applied it with with a rag then? I did. Yes. And yeah. how, how big is this table? It's about eight feet by forty-five inches. Nice. So we're gonna have to talk about that because I've always that's always been something that I think a lot of woodworkers have trouble even thinking about doing is trying to wipe on or, or rag on um, mm -hmm. any kind of a water-based finish. So I'd love to hear more about how you do it. We'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, now, Chris, tell us about the runs you had. Speaking of the finish application, you have some little bit of runs. Sure. What I did was I wanted to build the, the finish first. So what I did was I took a foam brush for the first two coats and I put it on heavily just to build it. And, I, and the, as a result, I had runs off the edge of the table. And all I did once I got those two coats on and let them dry, I just took off the runs with a, a scraper and then sandpaper. And then I applied my, my final coat ragged on with no runs. Cool. Nice. Have you ever sprayed? Me? Uh, very little. I recommend it. It's a blast. It's, it's a blast. So. It's a blast. It's, it's a game changer. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Someday yeah. I will wear out my Erlex and I will get a nice Fuji like QX4 and I will spray. Mm, that's and nice. My heart's content. But. Never spray upwind. No, I, I have a little portable booth with fans and stuff, so it works pretty well. So. Well, and with the water-based stuff, uh, you can get a little get away with having a less um, expensive fan in place for that stuff. So yeah, you don't need the what do they call them? Spark-proof fans or yeah, explosion-proof like fans. Explosion-proof, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a picture of the table there for you guys to look oh, at. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Wow. So no no problems with uh, streaking or the finish drying too fast as you're ragging. Like, did you have to just go like a maniac on that thing to get it on there before um, it dried? Well, that void in the middle helps a lot because you don't have to go from side to side. I was able to work from the outside in. Mm -hmm. um, I found that if I had too much finish, I'd end up with streaks on either side, a little bit of wet finish that would drag along. Mm -hmm. With the right amount, with the right amount, it works perfectly. With too much, you get you get the wet beads, the wet runs, and with mm -hmm. not enough, it streaks, and 
you end up with too much friction between the pad and the wood. Okay. Wow, I'm going to have to try that because that, that has been something I've been hoping to be able to do at some point and just haven't had luck with it, so I'll definitely give that a shot. No, the other thing I really like about the Enduro Bar is I feel like some of the water-based finishes remain tacky even after they cure. Mm. Um, and the Enduro Bar to me is, is n does not do that, which I really, really like. Mm. Um, <laughs> but what I'll typically do is I'll save Enduro Bar for my last coat, and I'll just spray tons and tons of coats of... Um, you act shellac. Oh, okay. And, that, and I'll dilute it at first so it soaks in, and especially if I'm going to put that on top of like a Danish oil, and then I'll just save the expensive Enduro Bar top coat for the end. So, mm -hmm. um, so Mark, what's going on in your shop? You're building one. <laughs> You've got a little fest tool, hand tool station set up. Yeah. yeah is yeah. the stool the stool build is done, right? Uh, yeah, that's been completed. Um, in fact, I actually finished that build in the old shop. It was the last project before leaving that shop. So, uh, yeah, so that project is done, and now I've got a little... Um, I keep getting yelled at for calling it like a temporary shop because uh, Nicole's like, you, you better be careful saying that because that what you have in that little you know temporary shop is nicer than what some people have in their permanent shop. <laughs> and it's like, the temporary is just a time reference. I'm not saying that uh, i got to deal with this crappy little shop. I'm saying it, yeah. you know, I'm here for a temporary period of time. Yeah, um, you didn't call up anybody who has a shop like this sucks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it's still my tools that are in there. I have tools that I like. Yeah. Um, you know, but basically it's just uh, what I could fit into my garage without being too crowded. Uh, and it's kind of a challenge for me because I'm used to having all of my toys there. Yeah. Uh, so now it's just a nice little mixture of a uh, Festool package um, and uh, and my hand tools, um, which realistically, if you've got a Festool MFT, uh, you know, a chop saw, a uh, router, and your hand tools, you can make a ton of stuff. You know, you're actually not very limited in that case. Yeah. The, the thing is I just am going to have some issues with milling because um, I don't really like to, to mill boards by hand if I don't have to. Um, and I don't have my jointer or planer, so I may have to get some uh, pre-milled stuff to, to do any, yeah. any work in there. Yeah. And the shop build's coming along well? It is. It is, yeah. We're actually at the point where they brought in the lumber today. The uh, patio is in, the slab is in, and they're laying out the boards for the, the skirt around the outside. And I think by tomorrow we should have some things that look like walls, so I hope. That is very cool. Uh, what are you going to do for dust collection in there? Are you going to have a crawl space with ducts and electrical in there? Yeah, there's uh, uh, they're basically building the shop uh, a lot like the the house is built here, and we have an uh, attic crawl space, and that's where all the um, you know uh, any sort of utilities and things that we need to access and wires are run through that space. Um, so that will be where uh, well the dust collection is going to be inside the shop, so it's going to be inside the envelope, if you will. Okay. Uh, if we wind up going with like a traditional uh, heat pump HVAC system. Uh, the HVAC uh, pipe, that all goes through the attic space, which I was talking to Vic about today, about how crappy of an idea that is uh, in Arizona, where your attics can get up to like 170 degrees. But um, that's that's the way things are done around here. You know, nobody really... You don't put them in the, in the uh, crawl space? Um, well, it's in... It, if you have a crawl space, it's there. If you have like an attic, it's there. Okay. Um, but he, he's talking about running the, the, the work inside the shop so it actually doesn't have to sit in that 170 degree space. Um, so, but, but it's going well, man. It's, it's just a lot to think about. Like, um, I think we all kind of daydream about having this opportunity. Yeah. And, then, and then once you finally do, you're like, oh, crap, I really have to make these decisions now. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure to not screw it up. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I especially when people say, watch. I need to remodel the shop. Well, the key, the key is at this point, the thing that I've learned is to stay as flexible as possible, build as much like redundancy into the electric as you can. Because the truth is, I don't really know how I'm going to use this space until I'm in it. So how can I pick the absolute perfect location for an outlet? Yeah. You know, I can only guess. Um, so, so I, I want to make sure there's enough flexibility that I can move things around uh, and just grow with the space, like we all do with our workspaces. It's always an evolution. So, will your dust collection duct work be inside the shop, mm -hmm. uh, on the walls, or okay? So, you're not going to do the the um, outlets in the floor. No, you know what? And I did, yeah. I did think about it for a few seconds, and then I realized that's just like choosing where uh, you know the outlets go for electricity. Uh, putting your dust collection in the floor is one heck of a commitment. Yeah. And I just don't want to commit that much, um, you know, not to mention the questions of repairability, um, yeah. clogs and cleanouts and things like that. So uh, I think it's more versatile just to have the, the duct work, you know, right on the ceiling. Yeah, cool. You going to do a dedicated finishing room? 
I will have a finishing space and right now part of the strategy of not making too many decisions ahead of time is to not make any interior walls. Um, there's a bathroom and that's the only interior wall that's going to be in there. Um, so I will have the option to erect a wall at some point if I want to make a finishing room or finishing lean-to or something. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. a little more of a, a dedicated space. There's, there's going to be a window over there and there's a window on the other side. So if I want to set up some sort of a sort of cross ventilation wind tunnel effect, I can do that. Um, but I'm not really going too hardcore in terms of like putting in a you know the perfect fan and and you know yeah. walls and everything just yet. Yeah, I think your flexibility thing is is the key because everybody's trying to design the perfect shop and yeah. the perfect shop depends on what kind of work you do, what project you're working on. If you can't move stuff, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and if your if your tools are stationary, then you need some kind of you might need some kind of cart to move materials around. And yeah. if your finishing room is too small for a project, then what do you do? And so, absolutely, yeah, it can, it can be really tricky, and that's that's the thing. I just want to avoid being overly committal <laughs> into anything because yeah. So I just want the flexibility, and I want to have the ability to change my mind. You know, to upgrade yeah. a tool, to put something in a different place. Yeah. yeah. So when do they think this thing's going to be done, and that you'll be able to move in? Oh, well, at this point, uh, the builder gave me an approximate 60-day time frame when it first started. So wow. we're looking at potentially like another 45, a uh, month and a half or so. Um, at the rate they're going, man, I, I think it may happen. It, to me, at first, it's like um, I think of the money pit when you're like, two weeks, two weeks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but at this point, it actually looks like it could very well hit that time frame. Um, I do have pictures if you guys want to see them. Yes, can, please. That would be fantastic. Roll a little slideshow here. Um, give me a second to to do just that. Uh, da -de -de. Can you do like a David Niven style voiceover? <laughs> that fake British accent? <laughs> uh, it would be absolutely terrible. Perfect. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. And hopefully this works. Cool. So everybody can see that. Okay, and I also have um, some shots that I could do after this where I'm, it's kind of a time lapse. I basically go outside and stand in the same place at the end of every day and take a picture. I <laughs> hope <laughs> that it's close to a time lapse. Uh, but these are just random shots where you can see the current, uh, current progress of the patio. Uh, the, the so patio, that patio is between the house and the shop? Yes, that's connecting the, the, the existing house patio to the shop's patio. Oh, I see. The shop is in the back. Yes. So yeah, this so would be like your walkway from the house down the L to the shop. You got it, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so basically we had to, because of the HOA requirements and just the general upkeep in the neighborhood, you have to kind of put a little more into this than just like putting up a steel building or something. Right, so of right. course, full-scale patio to match what we have with the overhang and everything. Uh, so these are just a few more shots of the, the slab. This is from last week. Uh, the footers are in for the posts and... What are those? Uh, what are those things over on the left of the, of the sidewalk there? Those are the future home of the the vertical posts that support the overhang for the patio. Oh, great, cool. Okay, yeah. so your shop's gonna have a little out patio outdoor area. Yep, exactly. Um, and this is a porta potty. Nice. <laughs> uh, there, there, yeah, there will <laughs> be a um, there will be a driveway that that's poured there, but that's gonna be poured as one of the last things to to yeah. avoid it getting damaged. Cool. Uh, the concrete, this is uh, two of the outlets that are going to be installed um, for some of the 220. And I did I did commit to a few locations in the floor because I figured, you know what, at this stage, it's yeah. cheap enough to do. Um, yep. If I don't put the tool there eventually, I can't be that far off. Um, so it's just yeah, going to be really can make some really 220 extension cords for pretty cheap. Yeah, yeah. And it's much better than running it to the wall. You know, it, at least I'll just be running somewhere in that vicinity on the floor. That's cool. That's very cool. Um, so, of course, there's a little bit of plumbing. I've got a slop sink going in and a toilet and just a regular sink in the bathroom, uh, which is uh, something I've always wanted is to have plumbing. And it sounds weird. But I don't know about you guys, but if I have to go inside to go to the bathroom just to go, like, pee, I get so distracted. And yeah. it, it, maybe it's a, just a personality flaw, but I go in there and I'm like, oh, let's see what Nicole's wow. doing. You know, let's let's go see what the dogs are doing. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm I so do is I try to avoid peeing, so I hold it, and then I start rushing <laughs> my work. And, uh, I mean, my, my, my dream shop would also have a stand-up shower, but, mm, but right. I do, like, I would want, a, uh, like, a, a high school drinking fountain and a urinal, too. <laughs> my shop. Give me a urinal. <laughs> that would be awesome. Oh, man, but uh, this this is actually the current, well, this is what it looks like right now today. They brought some of the lumber in. Uh, they've got some of the, the material for the walls getting ready to go up tomorrow. It's my dog 
attacking me mid-flight. Right. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is also just taken right before we went live. So, um, so that's that. And I can quickly show you the, um, uh, the photos for the future time lapse, at least what we've got so far. That'd be great. Um, it's kind of cool. I did a decent job of keeping everything together. And let me share that one. There we go. All right, so this is how it looked. Uh, this is how it looked before. I seem to have managed to get pictures of of the same dog peeing in the same spot multiple times, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know I how do he, he, his timing is impeccable. Uh, but we had a little fire pit there, which was kind of nice. I was sad to see it go. Um, maybe in the future, when when we get some funds to <laughs> freed up from this ridiculous expenditure, uh, maybe we'll be able to put something like that in again. But uh, so that was right before the work began, and then they just came in with a jackhammer and tore some crap up. Wow. Um, yeah. So literally just two guys and a jackhammer uh, tore everything up, and then the following day they just did a bunch of cleanup. That wasn't your trailer in the background. No, that was a uh, just a pull b behind, like um, uh, just for garbage and rubble that they just kind of load all the stuff in there. So no, that's not that's not mine. Or you, you or you mean the uh, travel trailer on the other side? Mm -mm. I meant the the garbage yeah. dealie. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're we're cleaning up the rubble, and now they're starting to um, level the the foundation and put down some ABC and. Tearing it up a little bit more. This is when they started to bring back the fill dirt. They're pouring in uh, the footings and things like that, or getting ready for the footings. And more progress there. Now they're getting ready for the concrete at this stage. There's the uh, the first um, the first pour was the the primary slab. It's a four inch concrete slab. Um, with a very deep footing on the outside. Uh, we don't have frost here, so there's no frost line concerns. Um, you know, there's no rebar or anything in that. This is just standard practice for um, something that's not going to be under wow, an extreme no load. Well, there is rebar, not in the slab. The rebar is in the footing. Um, on the edge. And it basically makes the, the rebar itself is bent to take the 90 degree turn from the, from the footing into the slab. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so there is definitely some support there, but uh, in the main four-inch part of the slab, there isn't any, you know, wire or anything in there. Uh, and then after the patio was poured, uh, we're pretty much where we are today with the rest of the patio in place. That's cool. That's exciting. It is, dude. It's uh, it's very exciting and very uh, expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we just uh, we just sold the house that the shop was in. Um, so now we're trying to just financially uh, make this little miracle happen. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's going to take a little while to recover <laughs> from this. Uh, but what what choice that I have? It's like I, I need to move on this. I need to get this shop going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions from the chat room there. Um, Tim asks why the, why are you building a new shop? First of all. Yeah, I just um, re just referenced the house that we sold. We we've been carrying two mortgages for years now because we tried to sell our old house, got screwed at the last minute as everything fell through during the closing, um, and we had to carry the house through this uh, you know terrible real estate market that we're in. Um, so finally, as things looked like they started to pick up a little bit, we put the house back on the market, not really expecting it to sell, uh, and it sold on the first day. We had a buyer on day one, so I immediately was like crap, there goes my shop. I mean, it was great that we sold the house, but that was where all my tools were. Um, so that and was... your parents, the right? Weren't your parents in the house? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So basically, oh. and uh, just to get a little personal, all of the money, what little we made, because obviously we, we got, you know, he got yep. it handed to us yep. on that transaction, uh, what little we made went into the purchase of their new home. So I saw, like, literally saw nothing out of that. Right. Um, and that's why the, we're having some difficulty getting the build going is because we weren't able to take that money and roll it into the shop. Uh, that was rolled into my mom getting a new place. Um, so that was the reason for uh, ultimately the dream and the reason we bought this property was because we had the room for the dream shop. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to do it two years ago, but the house sale fell through and it just wasn't happening. So now it's at the point where, okay, this is just the perfect time to do it. We may not completely have the financial picture completely straightened out, but we'll, yeah. we'll figure it out. You know, we'll, we'll pull some tricks out of our, out of the bag and hopefully make it happen. That's cool. Thanks for sharing your shop. Um, is there going to be like a little desk or office area in there, or are you going to continue to do that stuff in the house? 
Uh, well, you know what? I always have to have something in in the shop for live broadcasts, yeah. and just because I like to kill time doing you know what I shouldn't be doing, um, and I will not have my editing equipment in the shop. Um, yeah. there, anything that's in the shop is sacrificial, as we know. So, um, so the good stuff stays in the house. And when I'm doing editing, I don't really want to be in the shop. I'm, I'm yeah. doing you know editing is a different experience from. Uh, filming and actually doing the live demos. So there will definitely be a little bit of a, a work area, but not much dedicated space to office type stuff. It's it, I just don't need it. That's very cool. Well, so let's talk about uh, some other things going on. So Wood Talk Online Radio just had its 100th episode, right? <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Uh, I don't know how we're still doing this after five years. In, in the podcasting world, it's, that's ridiculous. That's, that's, a, that's like... People say, okay, you could stop now. You know, you hit 100, yeah. you're done. <laughs> you guys did your thing. I, I tell you, I, um, almost every weekend I take a long road trip, two and a half hours each way. Mm -hmm. And, I, I man, I, I, I put a new stereo in my truck just so that I could get um, Bluetooth because I was tired of doing the ridiculous try and broadcast over FM to a station thing. Oh god, they still make primarily those? just like I listen to podcasts, primarily for Wood Talk Online Radio. Okay, nice. So, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think um, I don't know. I think the I think the podcast is great. And is there anything new coming up for that, or is it going to be the um, keep doing what you're doing? Or well, we we do like to stick to our formula, and uh, I like to say that that's because we think it's a successful one. But the truth is, we're just lazy. Right. Um, you know, the, any any new change is just more work. But uh, that said. We kind of decided that after doing the 100th episode, the concept of people calling in uh, really was fun. We really yeah. enjoyed it. Technologically, it's fairly easy to do. It's just more you know, timing on my part to make sure we pull the person in at the right time and don't cut them off. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to become a bigger part of the show. Um, we're going to actually have people call in with questions and just say hi and you know, maybe sit on the line with us for five minutes if, it, if the chemistry is there um, and just have fun. You know? so, so I think that's a big part of what we're going to do. Um, but, you know, we, we have that same basic formula. We'll talk online is always about, you know, what, what we happen to be working on and then community stuff, what's going on in the, the blogosphere, what's going on in, in our friends' shops, uh, and then any sort of instructional information that we can do in main topics for each show. Um, so we're going to kind of stick with what we do best. So instead of voicemails, this will be live calling. Yeah, we'll still have voicemails just because people yeah. tend to leave them. Uh, we have to have voicemails because I miss Ricardo when Ricardo doesn't call him. Oh, um, Roberto. Roberto. Roberto, Roberto right. Yeah, he, he moved. He was Roberto from New Mexico, and now I think he's in Illinois, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, uh, we do have a voicemail in the hopper waiting for uh, the next show. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll do voicemails, and we'll definitely uh, – this call-in thing is, you know, it's classic. It, it's like biting off a classic radio. It's uh, yeah. you know, People like to call in and just say hi, so why the heck not do it? Right on. So with the shop under, under construction, um, I imagine that's kind of limiting your uh, ability to do projects a little bit? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Yeah. So what's next for the, for, the, for the free site, and also what's next for the guild? Well, the free site is, um, you know, the free site is kind of have has always been my bread and butter. Yeah. Um, with our sponsors and everything like that, it's the reason anybody even knows the name. So, um, we will always continually, you know, massage the free site and do whatever we can to provide uh, good content there. Um, but there's a little bit of a challenge for me on a on a personal level because the guild is growing and the guild is where it's a different relationship, right? The free site, I'm making content and it's an indirect paid relationship because I have sponsors and advertisers who are paying and the viewers are getting their content so someone else is footing the bill, you know, right. if you will. Um, Essentially the, guild, the sponsors pay you to deliver content to their, their customers. Right. Yeah, and they and the, the, the relationship there is the eyeballs are watching it and they get to see the ads and that's your classic advertising model. Yep. Um, but I'm kind of burning the candle at both ends because I've got a very standard paid model on the other end of it. So here's a group of people who are now paying me directly, cutting out the middleman and saying, I'm giving you a few bucks uh, to, to make content for me. Um, very different relationship. And in fact, a relationship that I feel much more obligated to provide content for. Um, that direct relationship weighs heavily on your mind. I mean, you know yeah. how it is. Someone gives like a commission for a project that you're building. Someone's paying you to build that you better give it your best, you better put everything into it. Um, so a huge thing that's going to be changing in the next uh, few weeks is, is the, the structure of the guild and um, the system of what the guild actually is, is undergoing some pretty significant changes that we're, we're looking forward to. Yeah, you've updated the site uh, design and structure 
mm -hmm. often, which I, I actually really appreciate. Instead of just instead of just focusing on the content, you've also focused on kind of the usability of the guild and the free site. Yeah. And I and I think that I think that's great. And I know that underscore funk has done a lot of that work. But yeah. I, I, I got to tell you, it's a it's a beautiful site. A beautiful. Well, site. thank you, thank you. And and the I thing see a lot is, of you, crappy ones in my day job. So. <laughs> yeah, you 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 hit the nail on the head though, because. Uh, uh, one of the best things that that happened to my business was meeting uh, John Funk. Um, he is an absolutely incredibly talented designer, and we've been we just were talking about it the other day. We've been working together for about three years now, and it all started off with him designing a logo for us. Um, and we just sort of built this relationship of uh, you know just anything that I needed on the website. He's kind of um, you know the Renaissance man of of, of that type of work, um, but he happens to be an incredibly clever coder and takes a WordPress site and makes it look anything, you know, like anything but a WordPress site. Um, so now what everything that he did with the free site, he's now focusing all of his attention on the guild site. So the, the sort of radical change that we saw on the, the free site just recently, we're going to see something similar but a very different thing, a similar level of change coming to the guild site um, that's just going to be absolutely awesome. Um, and the great thing about John is that he's a, he's a woodworker an incredibly talented uh, coder and graphic designer, so uh, we are able to, to to work really well together and to brainstorm ideas. And I say, John, I need this thing to, to work this way, and I need it to look cool at the same time. You know, how can we make that happen? Um, and he's just a really smart guy, so we kind of go back and forth with these things and kind of co-create what you guys are seeing on, on the free site and the guild site. That's awesome. Yeah, That's really it, cool. It's really a lot of fun. Well, um, we're kind of at the point where uh, I've asked people in the chat room um, if they have any kind of challenges they're experiencing in their woodworking to offer up questions, and I think Chris has already started to, um, to farm those. So, Chris, you want to those for us? Okay. First I'll question. I'll try to answer time. quicker yeah. in the future. <laughs> hmm? I'll try to answer first faster. Sure. Yeah, first question comes from Mike. Uh, Maybe coin it. There you go. Um, this question is, if you're routing a groove in a tabletop for an inlay that's curved, how would you go about it to fit the inlay to the groove? Hmm. A curved inlay, I mean, I'll be honest, that's not really something that I, that I do very often. A uh, curved inlay is going to be a little bit tricky because you'd have to have the piece, um, you know, be small enough to be able to take that curve, right? So it's either a very thin inlay uh, or if you're talking about something on a larger scale, you know, that, that's going to be really tricky to pull that off. You know, like if you've seen the curved tables that have, um, you know, an outer piece of trim that matches that exact profile, you know, and then you're talking about some, some wacky template action to be able to get those things to match up, those two profiles to match up perfectly. So, I mean, I've never really done much in the way of curved inlay, so I would hope that the, uh, the inlay would be able to bend enough to take that curve, but quite honestly, I've never really done that. So if it were stringing, you'd be, if it were only a, a, an eighth inch or so, just a little contrasting line, you could just mill that piece straight and then fit it into the curve if it's not too severe. Yeah. Uh, well, in water. Yeah, I mean, it would have to be thin, and especially a piece, if it is that thin, you could soak it in water you know, and get some hot water, and it probably would, would bend significantly better uh, without cracking. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that, that would be the route that I would take unless he's talking about a larger inlay um, what do you do? I mean, if it's like a quarter inch, you can't really bend that very effectively uh, to match a specific um, a specific profile. That would be tricky. I guess there there is there are the uh, inlay kits for a router where you have a bushing and then a step bushing that, that fits over top of it. Right. To do the male right. and the female part, that might be the best approach for a larger, non flexible inlay. Yeah, that actually is a good point. And then, then you could just kind of, um, you know, you're going in all directions, which unfortunately when you do something like that, you wind up with weak points it, it, because you're, you are going to have end grain uh, exposure at some point. So you would have to be um, careful. It would be a more fragile piece, but that seems like probably a better route to go if it's a little bit thicker. Another question? Yep. Um, I'm, trying, I'm, trying to mold, I'm trying to pull up a, a picture of an inlay kit at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, the next question came from Dave Barden. Um, do you still live feed from your shop? And I do that's yes. Yeah, I do. Um, when I'm building, typically, if I'm not really doing anything and I'm just kind of, you know, just preparing for something, you know, filming or whatnot, I, I don't usually turn it on. Um, I think in the new shop, you'll probably see a lot more activity because, again, part of the change in the guild is a lot more projects coming out. 
Um, so we're just going to be hammering project from project to, to the next one. And, um, and I usually when I'm working, I just like to have the camera on just to kind of give people something to look at if they're you know sitting at work in a cubicle and would rather daydream about woodworking. It's nice to, <laughs> to have a place to go to do that. I think there was a something on Twitter about watching concrete dry the other day. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it maybe it's interesting to people. <laughs> I mean, there were like 60 people watching it, so, um, so you yeah, know, can't complain. But you know, that's the thing. I I, I worked in a cubicle doing tech service um, for an antibody company for a couple of years. Uh, I can't think of any more boring thing uh, to do with my life. And I sat and read woodworking magazines. And if there was a live stream, someone building a shop and they had a concrete slab that was drying, darn it if I wouldn't sit there and watch it. <laughs> you know, because it was better than my job. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for with my tweet alongs anyhow. So um, um, one question from Scott um, about your website. Have all has all the has all the Russian mafia denial of service stuff, is that over? Or are you still struggling with that? <laughs> you never know if it's over because you can't control it and it just kinda happens. Um it it's it, it's over for the time being. Right. Um, so if, if they decide to attack us again, there's not... I mean, you could do things to defend yourself. You can try to, to you know, sort of just weather the storm. You could take your site offline and just wait till it ends. Um, or you could put in significant defenses uh, ahead of time to be prepared for this onslaught of traffic. Um, a lot of ways you can handle it, and you just got to hope that it doesn't happen again. But, uh, yeah, for now, it, it's, it is over. Um, we do have protection in place should something happen. Um, but... Yeah, you know, who knows? Um, I, I, I know as little about the whole thing and why it happened uh, now as I did then. Um, so if it happens again... Yeah, trying to understand the motivation, I don't, I don't get yeah. it. <coughs> you know, I, it, I've done my share of, like, you know, I can be a... I can be, excuse the language, a smartass sometimes, and, and yeah. I think sometimes that comes across on, on comments and things that I might make on the website, or um, I'm also very outspoken about how I moderate anything that I'm in charge of. Don't um, be a dick is your rule, or don't be a jerk is your rule, right? <laughs> yes, it's yes, it's the G-rated version of that. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do moderate people, and I, I have had to tell people, look, you know, I don't know how to say this in a way that's not going to really going to piss you off. Um, but you just can't talk like that in our in our forum. You need to speak to someone the way you would talk to them if you, they were right in front of your face. And I can guarantee you that is not how you would talk to that person if you were standing face to face. So feel free to express your viewpoint, but can you please do it in a way that isn't going to um, fuel an argument, you know, and make this yeah. a, a hostile place to be? Saturday Night Live did a great skit about anonymous posters <laughs> and um, had, them, had them get confronted with the people that they were posting against and um, yeah. expose their real lives. And I, th I thought it was great. So. It's genius. Yeah. yeah, and that's the thing. I think you do that to some people and they, you know, it's this whole anonymity thing. Um, and they fly off the handle, and, and perhaps I did that to the wrong person. Hmm. You know, you just don't know. Right but on. Um, your buddy ahead. Matt wants to know if nah, you, we don't answer questions from him. If you were a fest tool tool, what tool would you be and why? Um, I would be a domino. The because big domino, I, of course, not the small domino. <laughs> we grande domino. <laughs> Either one, because I would be I would be a tool that makes half of the people say, yeah, awesome, and the other half go, that's a piece of crap. I'm never going to buy that. I like, to, uh, I like to split right down the middle. <laughs> yeah, I have um, I've decided that with my personality, I can't buy one Festool tool. <laughs> because it's, it's, yeah. like, um, it's like those uh, smelling salts that make you eat people's faces, right? As soon as I try it once, I'm going to be huffing paint. I'm going to be smelling gas. Yeah. Like... So I just I can't do it. Um, yeah. But my compromise is lately, I've had some tools die. I had my, uh, and they were like 15 years old. My Porter Cable Ross died, and my Porter Cable 690 router um, died. It didn't really die, but it almost killed me, and I threw it in the garbage. And I replaced them with Bosch. <laughs> okay. So that's my compromise. The Bosch makes great stuff. Yeah, and I found out that the trick is... Um, when investigating a Bosch tool, go to their site and look for the country of origin. Mm, if it's really? Switzerland, if it's Switzerland, you're buying something great. So, okay. Um, so I got their new six-inch uh, Ross, which has great uh, dust collection, and I got their new router that has the um, power switch in the handle, 
on okay. both the plunge base and the fixed base, and that also has pretty good dust collection. So nice. That's my Festool compromise, but. Well, you know what? I think I, I like to think that Festool's popularity and um, just sort of becoming more aware with mainstream woodworkers is really just going to raise the bar on all the tool brands. They all Absolutely. have to start thinking Absolutely. about you know dust collection, ergonomics, and, and we're going to start to see that gap close a little bit on lower priced um, yeah. tools out there, which is great. Yeah, when the track saws came out, Dewalt Makita made track saws. Mm -hmm. um, I think saw stop is going to have an impact on the industry. Um, well, yeah. it already is, and the lawsuit is, but uh, right. but riving knives and 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 you know all, all these things. I mean, comp, comp, all this competition is good. I just wish we could get some American tool manufacturers that make power tools. We've got mm -hmm. plenty of um, hand tool makers, but I'd really love to find some American hand tools. So yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. Bill Griggs wants to know how many people you have in your phone crew. In my, my film crew? In your film crew. I think it's two plus Mateo. <laughs> yeah, when he comes in and goes blah, blah, blah once in a while. Uh, yeah, I wish I had a film crew. Um, it's just me, my camera, a tripod, and uh, that's about it. Um, in the beginning, Nicole used to help me out uh, once in a while, and that's where all the outtakes came from because I'd, I'd have fun doing it, and I'd laugh or mess up, and something funny would happen, but uh, that's why there's really no outtakes anymore on the show is simply because it's just me and my shop, and, and when you mess up, in a situation like that, it's usually not funny what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that I am the film crew. Yeah. Chris, you want to read Mark's question? Sure. Um, Mark, where are we here? Mark Cherry. Um, how long has Mark been doing woodworking, and what training has he had? I have been. I always have trouble remembering this. Someone asked me this in last night's live meeting. I'm like. Uh, right there with my marriage. I'm not sure how long I've been married either. Um, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, I would say probably 10, it's like 10 or 12 years that I've actually been woodworking. Not very long. Um, I really started it out as a hobby, like a lot of us, and then um, got you know fairly competent at it uh, quickly enough, and I started to build projects for um, coworkers and actually got my first few commissions that way. And it kind of gave me the confidence that uh, even with a fairly you know fundamental level of uh, experience that I might actually be able to, to make some spare money with this and that eventually transitioned into starting a, a business with it. Um, what wound up happening was there was a, a transitional period for me where I was really just absolutely miserable with my job um, but I was very clearly passionate about woodworking. I had studied every book I could get my hands on, read every article, I've watched you know every episode of was when uh, Woodworks was on TV with David Marks and I watched every episode you know, numerous times. I had it on TiVo, so I'd watch it over and over. Um, and, you know, just it's basically self-taught up to that point. And then an opportunity came up to work with David Marks, and he actually started offering, this is when he first started offering his classes. Um, and Nicole treated me to a uh, marketry class and then uh, several days of a one-on-one -on -one class. Um, and I went up to Santa Rosa, hung out with them. We hit off. We're both um, drummers from New Jersey and uh, have a little bit of a, a shared heritage that way. Um, so we hit it off, and uh, I asked him if he would ever consider letting me come out and spend some time there and just kind of uh, pseudo-apprentice with him. Uh, so that was something that we put into the plans, and um, I went and spent about a month and a half with him the first time, and I've been back a couple different times. Never, and it's really hard at this stage in life to be able to go away, you know, for two months um, and be away from home, especially now with a kid. It's ridiculous. Uh, but at the time, I was able to spend a, a decent amount of time up there. So I, I, I can't call it an apprenticeship, but I, I, I did work with him and um, you know studied all of his methods, uh, and then actually got to have a great opportunity to to have some hands on and work with him uh, on a, several occasions. So uh, beyond that, I've, I just like everybody else, whenever the funds are there, I like to take classes. Um, even though I'm, I'm teaching classes at William Ng, I look forward to going there every year to uh, take classes, too, um, just because learning and continuing my, my personal journey um, is really important to me. Um, I may be at a position where I, where I can teach a lot of the basics, um, but there's still so much advanced stuff that, that I, I need to wrap my brain around, and, and I want to yeah. be able to teach people who are, who are following my journey. I've got to get there. Um, so I have to continue to to teach myself and, and never think that I'm beyond the point that I need to take a class. Yeah. And you yeah. did some time in a refinishing shop, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When uh, when I was when we moved to Arizona, started my business, 
struggled with it for uh, quite a while and just trying to make ends meet, um, I had to go back to work. I found a job at a local engineering place that needed someone to do environmental assessments and I did some crappy work there for a while. Hated every minute of it and that kind of filled me with the sort of piss and vinegar that I needed to, to go back into my own business and, and just whatever it took, I needed to make it work because I had left corporate America. I was in a position where it's like, all right, I've gotten a taste for what it's like to work for myself now. It is so difficult to go back and work for someone else. Um, you're almost unemployable at that point. So um, <laughs> I was absolutely miserable. And I saw an ad for a refinishing shop that, that had a part-time opening. And I'm like, perfect. If I could work part-time, that'll get me enough money that I can put like at least something toward the mortgage. Um, and then I could spend the rest of the time working on my own projects to build up my business. Uh, so, so I wound up doing that for a good long time. And, and frankly, that's where most of my interest and, and love of finishing came was by working in a refinishing shop and just working with um, so many different materials uh, to try and get these uh, these refinished pieces to look, you know, either to match something else or to restore them to, to their previous beauty. Um, so that's, uh, you know, tied into my, my background in science and chemistry, um, just made finishing one of the things that I tend to gravitate toward. I, I you know, I, I got to tell you, the, the, the thing I used to hate most about woodworking was... Um, when the product was, was done being built, and I had to sand it and finish it. <laughs> and um, You're not alone. <laughs> and so your, your videos about finishing, about you know, a simple wipe on varnish, um, about dyes and things like that, really made that actually one of the more enjoyable parts for me. So, okay. And I really appreciate like, the chemistry background, where you're looking, looking at the MSDS, and you're talking mm -hmm. about... Um, Oh gosh, it's not water-based; it's waterborne. And right. I mean, to me, like somebody can tell me just do this, but having the background of the why and the chemical structure and things like that, I I, I think it's great. So I to totally appreciate that. So cool. Well, thank you. I'm glad. Glad uh, you're enjoying. I do a book for you, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, the the book was an interesting thing because I I'm not not a good writer. You know, I mean, I I do my best, and I have. Um, moments of inspiration where I could just kind of, the words just flow, uh, but to continuously write and to actually, you know, accumulate something that could even be called a book is a, is a huge challenge for me. Um, but I was able to get enough words together to, to make something that's, um, uh, what, what, what would you call a crossbreed between a pamphlet and a book? <laughs> it's like, because it's just not that, it's not that big of a, a, a book. A guide, a finishing <laughs> guide. It's a, it's a, it's a quick guide. Um, but, you know, like everything that I do, it's, it's really just my perspective on things. None of this stuff is new. All this information is out there somewhere else in, in various places. Um, but sometimes I think, you know, and this is something that I, I'm always concerned about as I get more into, into woodworking, is that as time goes on, you sometimes forget the things that, that caused you problems in the beginning. You forget how to talk to the person who's fairly new to this. Um, so it's very important that I, I constantly remind myself of what people have problems with so that I can say, you know, it's a special way of talking to, to your, your woodworking colleagues that isn't, you know, not talking down to them. Uh, you're not using words that they don't understand. You're not talking about concepts they don't understand. You're bringing it to a level um, that it's like, look, I'm just sharing this. I'm sharing, even if, you know, this is fairly new to me too, uh, but here's how I understand it. Uh, and, and those types of things, I think people really appreciate um, being talked to that way, you know, in a very conversational tone. So that's how the book is, is written in that sort of conversational tone, pretty much the way that I, I write blog posts and, and articles and things that I've done in the past. That's cool. So um, let's talk about, uh, you mentioned that there's some advanced stuff that you wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. So how would you say over the years your woodworking has evolved? And what are those things that you want to that you want to tackle and learn? I would say evolution-wise, my woodworking has slowed down dramatically uh, my personal uh, evolutionary path as a woodworker ever since I started The Wood Whisperer, um, primarily because now when I do a project, I have the considerations of how is this going to be perceived by the audience, is this the right type of project that I can teach well. Um, so if a topic is very new to me, I may not necessarily be comfortable doing that in form of a video just yet because I don't, I don't feel like I'm ready to teach that just yet. Um, so, so my personal path, and this is something that I'm trying to change now with some of the upcoming changes in the guild, is to allow me to have the freedom to move forward on my own personal path. Um, so, so one of the concepts that we're doing in the guild is instead of everything being 
what we know now as a, a guild build. It's basically this major undertaking, uh, a hand-holding sort of event where I take people through literally every step of the project that you could possibly imagine uh, in video form. And sometimes um, each step twice. <laughs> if, yeah. Different ways of doing things. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, it, and it depends on who you are. That's very useful to a lot of people. Um, but at some point, we need to break away from that. So part of the strategy is to do different types of video projects. So now the, the guild videos are going to come in three different flavors. One will be the guild builds that we know and love. Um, another will be advanced level projects. And the idea is these are the projects where I'm pushing my own personal limits. I'm going to enter into something that I may not necessarily know how I'm going to come out of it. That's uh, but, cool. That's very you know, cool. But we'll get there together. So if I'm going to really dive into something with bent lamination, um, you may see me crack some boards <laughs> before I figure out what the right thickness is for those uh, lamination pieces, or maybe I need to change my bending form. Um, if we get into marquetry, something I want to get uh, into a lot more, uh, you may see some crappy looking pieces as I uh, increase my skill level. Um, but that, will, that type of advanced project will allow us to not necessarily talk about that mortise and tenon joint that we've done a hundred times already. Um, let's skip past that. Let's talk about design. You know, let's talk. Let's get other people in uh, to the process, and maybe someone who knows more about—not that that's hard to find—more about design than I do. Um, have some of these people who have much more experience in these areas to come in and consult with me, um, and just share that experience. Um, so, so that's part of my strategy, so that I can move on, because I do feel like I've been a little bit um, stagnant. I mean, I've progressed. I've I've gotten more into the green and green stuff, which I love, mm -hmm. um, but I've definitely put the brakes on because I'm so busy helping other people. Uh, progress in their own journey, you know, so it's a, it's a bit of a, a challenge for someone in my position who wants to keep growing. Cool. So who are some of your favorite um, online woodworkers, especially maybe some people that um, we, we might not be expecting? That's a good question. Um, online, it's tough, it, and, and this is a personal challenge uh, of mine. I mean, I've been doing this now for six years and uh, you know Twitter first came out and I, I was you know probably one of the first dozen woodworkers to touch Twitter um, and you know you're waiting for the rest of the people to come along so you can have someone to talk to um, now it's it's huge man I mean you guys know how it is it's I find it tough to actually follow anybody um, yeah. because there's so much white noise and and there's so many people who are contributing great things what actually winds up happening is I usually have to wait until someone sends me an email and says, hey, you, you got to check this out. Look what this guy's doing. Um, you know, so the problem is I tend, to, I tend to follow the same people I've always followed, you know, people who, who I've connected with from the beginning. You know, I'm always a big fan of, um, of Vic. You know, Vic, uh, he hasn't made that many pieces, but I've been watching his shop grow. Um, his first piece winds up in fine woodworking. <laughs> you know, um, I think he's, he's a guy to watch, you know, yeah. if you're looking for, for people around. Um, yeah, I can even just look at... I think at all woodworkers in Washington State in general are awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Northwest. Yeah, the whole yeah. Northwest, even, even Port Moody, B.C., right, Chris? Yeah. I, yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with that. you got your uh, Daryl Peart up there. Yep. Um, you know, somebody who is, he's not so much involved online, but you may have heard him mention either in the Guild or on the Wood Whisperer site with his projects, is Tom Buell. Oh, yeah, great guy. Um, Fantastic. Absolutely nice guy. And his woodworking, like when I see the projects he makes, it's like we share a brain. He yeah. makes the type of things that I want to make. Um, you know, and, and the cool thing is for us, a lot of these guys, like your Daryl Peartz, your, uh, your David Marks, um, uh, what the heck's his name? Uh, drawing a blank, a Canthus workshop. Um, yeah, Bob, Charles Bender. Bob. Bender, no. exactly. Um, you know, you're seeing guys from the, sort of the old school coming into this environment and making themselves more accessible uh, in the environments that we like to play. Um, so it's fun watching all that happen. Um, but shoot, I mean, you're, I'm looking at this list of people in the, the tweet chat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of guys in here that I, I enjoy looking at their websites. Yeah. Problem is, I just don't have as much yeah, of an opportunity so to get in there and dig in. You know, I met Tom Buell at Woodworking in America. Great guy. Um, does very, very beautiful pieces. Great, great at design. Mm -hmm. But I feel like he has a small shop, too. He does. So he it, rolls it a lot of stuff out. You don't need the big, crazy shop, you, you know, to, to get out there and get, and get some beautiful work done, so... Yes, and don't, don't take this the wrong way, but uh, this was custom made for me from a special, um, he did a lot of projects, I, oh, what was it, is it the Belize special, like mahogany that he had, 
Mm -hmm. um, so I guess he had some scraps and he figured he would uh, make a few nice little things and send them out. So this is this is going to go on the wall in my shop from Tom Hewlett. Nice. Very cool. nice mahogany heart. And of course, you can just see that Tom is one of those people who puts that extra effort into every little detail. This thing is like the smoothest thing you will ever touch. <laughs> this little teeny tiny heart piece is so smooth it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, he was I sat next to him at the like what was it called? The Munchen House or whatever where we had the sausages and sauerkraut and stuff and mm -hmm. he was just he was just the coolest guy, so Yep, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple online events. One you started, which was this was the safety week, and then there's the get woodworking week. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on those or or other themed weeks that might be coming up? Well, get woodworking is um, uh, Tom's right, event, right uh, from Tom's workbench. Um, safety week, you know, that's just something I think every year. Yeah. You know, we went, we were probably just going to rehash the same topics over and over, but that's yeah. uh, it's a, just a refresher course, you know. Um, the other thing is that's kind of been a, a yearly thing that I think everybody's looking forward to is now the charity build. Um, oh, which, yeah. You know, which fell in last fall, and I'm, I'm going to have a, with the shop and everything, have a bit of a struggle getting something out in time. Uh, but we raised almost uh, ten grand again last year. That's crazy. Um, and that's over the course of the year with the various things. And I, I give a lot to, to Live Strong, and I do it under our, you know, the, the thing that we have set up that gives us, you know, credit for it. Um, so I give a lot personally to that as well. Um, so I think that's that's probably the other thing that I really want to expand out is the charity build because that was a huge success, raised a ton of money, and at the same time we're building something that the thing in and of itself can be donated for charity. Um, because ultimately when you look at what we've got here, all the things that we've built as a community, um, it's great that we can all learn, learn woodworking, and that's, that's obviously the, the yeah. meat and potatoes of what we're here to do. Um, but if we can just take some of that power, and it's really... You know, this is kind of what the internet is all about. Whether it's crowdsourcing or uh, Kickstarter programs and things like that, if everybody puts out a little, it becomes a lot. You know, and if we can do that with our community and direct our energies into something charitable like that, and, and I don't know anybody who doesn't have someone in their family that was touched by cancer um, in, in some way, shape, or form, um, there's there's few things that I can see that are, are more worthy uh, thing to put our money towards. So that that's where the whole woodworkers fighting cancer thing comes from, and, and hopefully we can continue to build upon that as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Now, that reminds me, was, was the, wasn't there a project a while back where um, the project was actually completed by a group of people and it was sent, mm -hmm. like one person did one piece and it was sent to the next piece? Yeah. I, thought, I thought that was, I thought that was uh, a pretty interesting way to get different people involved with different levels of expertise and, mm -hmm. and specialties. That was um, a Sawmill Creek forum project that someone, yeah, someone just pulled me in and said, "Hey, do you want to do a portion of this?" And I, I got to be the lucky guy that cuts the top off the box. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know that type of thing, great idea on paper, to actually execute yeah. it is really tricky and a huge pain in the butt. Yeah. Because um, someone inevitably at some point. Uh, winds up being the weak link in the chain, and the project gets held up for three weeks, and and it doesn't move on. Um, and that would be me. <laughs> that would probably <laughs> right. be me. I'd say yeah. sorry, I have to work 12-hour days for six weeks. Can't do it. So. Yeah, exactly. So it's really difficult to control that. Uh, and then really, when it's all said and done, a piece like that, the biggest thing you're going to have to practice is restraint, because everybody's got great ideas, and if we all put our great ideas, it becomes one really bad idea <laughs> you know, well, into this one piece. Sure. <laughs> exactly, yeah, so it's like anything else, like too many minds uh, making decisions here uh, becomes really difficult to, to execute and make it look good. Um, but I think that box, I don't even know that I've seen the finished product of that now years later. I don't know even right. what happened to it. Right. Cool. But it's, it's a neat idea, it's just uh, fairly difficult to execute. You have to really control each step, and, and frankly, I think you have to have a, a design completed ahead of time. So everyone agrees this is what we're all working toward and each person th then does a portion of that as yeah. opposed to kind of ad-libbing as they go. Yeah, when the project gets to me, I won't wing it. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, you I have your I'll job. Do it. it. And almost the person who's like the project coordinator, mm -hmm. you know, needs to be really on top of things. Well, and then you, you add in all the amount of, like, this is, this is the funny thing where we talk about charity and stuff like that. You add in the amount of money that each person has spent in shipping, uh, and then you look at what you finally made when it's all said and done, and you go, wow, that yeah. money would have totally been better spent going toward a charity <laughs> instead yeah. of going to the U.S. Postal Service. 
Yeah. <laughs> Which might be a charity uh, pretty soon, right? Yeah, they basically are. I think <laughs> not doing too well. <laughs> I think, but I think they're the kind of charity that they don't have to ask for donations. They just mm. take it out in that FICA part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. So we're at about time. Um, let's see if there's any more questions for the from the Twitter sphere, from the Twitter. It looks like looks like we're pretty caught up. Chris, do you Great. see anything? Okay. Um, Andy had asked uh, about a price range for the shop that you're building there, Mark. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we decided right we decided not to, um, you know, because we do. As you guys have probably seen over the years, we are pretty open about our lives, but uh, given our DDoS trouble and um, receiving financial help during that time, yeah. it starts to make things a little bit tricky to talk about money publicly, especially since um, this is actually not a business expense. This is a personal expense uh, because it is on my property. Um, so uh, let's just say it is north of six figures. And, and south of 200000 <laughs> So somewhere in that range. Gotcha. And I'll tell you the reason why it is so expensive. A lot of people are going to go, what? Um, is because this is not just a, a garage. This is basically a house with no interior walls. Right. Um, so it's being made to the level of our home. Uh, so it's you know a lot more pricey. And it's 1,800 square feet. Homeowners associations require that a lot of times. When we look yeah, it, I, it's got to look exactly it, like our house. Yeah, you can't just get one of those steel buildings delivered on a truck and propped up like a barn. They just yeah. they won't allow it anymore. Uh, no, I would be fined and probably. Uh, I I often wonder with an HOA what they can do if you like just ignore the rules other yeah. than just continually fine you every month. But uh, I don't want to find out. <laughs> so. yeah, cool. One question I had for you, Mark, about your shop. Yeah. Um, you've got a bathroom in there, so will that be a separate room? It will be. Yes, I'm not going to pee in the middle of the room. Although that would yeah. be funny for uh, the show. That would be uh, so awesome, though. <laughs> just a urinal up against the wall. Excuse yeah. me. I'll be right back, guys. <laughs> um, there is going to be like a washroom, so it'll be a toilet uh, and a little pedestal sink or something in there. And on the outside of that wall, sharing the plumbing is going to be a slop sink for for the shop side. Okay. So that that will be the only interior wall. Um, and then later, okay. I'm probably going to I'll probably box in the dust collector, you know, just for the sake of uh, noise okay. isolation. Uh, and again, we talked about the finishing room might be something that I'll do in the future. Have you thought about boxing off an office to keep the dust out? No, no, because everything I do that's really sensitive is here in the house, and I've got my office there. Um, and like I said, I've got a computer inside the shop that's, you know, I'd blow the dust off it periodically, um, but um, I don't know whether I'm just lucky, but I've never had a computer, you know, uh, just uh, kick the bucket on me in the shop. Um, it's, it's, it's been fine, and I don't build any special case for it. Uh, you know, it's a shop computer. It's sacrificial, so if something happened to it, it's not, you know, not the end of the world. I just have to, you know, use something, one of my old computers that's in a closet somewhere. Mm -hmm. So Vic asked, and I'm kind of curious, have you ever been approached about um, TV? You know, there in the beginning, there were um, some things going on with uh, independent producers that were like, you know, hey, we should do something together. Um, I did entertain it. We thought about it. Um, and then that particular thing just kind of fell through. It didn't feel right. Uh, we weren't comfortable with the way things were going, and we just opted out of it and just um, since then have just been doing our own thing. So no explicit offers uh, have come across the table. What I found out as I get more into this isn't really so much about offers. It's like if I really want to do a TV show, um, all I really need to do is contact a producer uh, and get a producer willing to work with me or just fund it myself. Uh, to make the show, and then your job becomes shopping it around to try to find underwriters so you can make some money, uh, and then uh, assuming the show is of good enough quality and you can get the interest, you can get it on PBS, or uh, you could even try to shop it around to you know DIY or HGTV, in which case it's a slightly different financial arrangement. You're not getting underwriters. Um, they're essentially you know going to be paying you for the content. When I look at that deal, you know, and I think of things like... Um, conversations that I've had with people and obviously you know Tommy Mac comes to mind um, with his uh, shift from the internet world to uh, TV um, I've got to say that is not a life I want um, I have heard that Tommy Mac is at just about every event that's out there um, I'm not a big fan of traveling I don't want some company telling me where I have to go and when um, I don't want to limit maybe you have to use exactly um, I, I, so you can yeah, and, and the thing is, I get this a lot where people are like, hey, you should be on TV. And I'm like, you know what? You would be the first person to complain that when you see my TV show, 
and of you know no fault of mine I'm limited to 22 minutes of actual content and you get almost nothing out of the show that I just made for you although it's very pretty um, when you compare that to what I could have done online with it you're gonna be very unhappy with that product it's a limitation of the medium it's not uh, you know when a lot of people yeah, and a lot of people criticize, you know, Tommy's show because he has to go fast. He does talk fast, but you know, he's an East Coast guy. But he only has 22 minutes to build a whole project. Things have to move fast. I, li- I liked his videos much better than I liked his show. Yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of people echo that that sentiment. And, and frankly, a lot of it isn't his fault because it's just the format. So, um, here's the thing: I've been really, really lucky to be able to forge my own thing online and go my own way. And I would be an idiot to turn my back on this even right. if it was for TV like yeah I could I might be able to get a bigger audience but I'm doing pretty good for myself in this situation and I wouldn't want to jeopardize that and I and frankly I think a TV situation might be a temporary like woohoo look at me uh, what happens after the two year contract and advertisers aren't making what they thought they would make on it what happened to my website in that meantime um, so, so frankly I'm Damn happy where I am. That's great. <laughs> so even if a, a explicit offer came across the the, the table for me, um, I probably would turn it down. Cool. Chris, you want to ask the last question, then we can wrap up. Sure. Last question goes to Bill Griggs, and he asks uh, Mark, "Do you have any plans to add a CNC?" <laughs> Not while I know my buddy Ron, who has a beautiful CNC machine, and I go, "Ron." Can you make me something? He goes, absolutely. Um, you know, oddly enough, uh, Rockler, uh, they're one of the sponsors of the, the Wood Whisper site. They are sending me one of their new, I don't know if you've seen it, but they've got these little mini bench top CNC carving machines. Yeah. Uh, I've, it, and the only reason I agreed to do it is because it's so small. Um, they're going to be sending me one of those to do a little video on. Um, is that so the carve right? Is it similar to the carve right? It's similar to that, very similar. So you're only talking about small, small format things that you can do. Um, but no, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm ever going to need a CNC. Uh, and again, CNC work is something I would rather you know pay someone else to do, uh, to do that portion, whatever I need CNC, like a template or uh, specialized yeah. stuff. Uh, but I don't. I don't see myself because here's the thing: CNC, it's a whole other thing to master, right? It's a computer program and, and setup and all that stuff. I don't even want to get involved in it yeah. if I don't have to. Cool. All right. Well, Mark, I just want to say thanks. It was great having you here. Great discussion. Um, thanks, guys. Obviously, you've done a lot for uh, online woodworking and, and helped bring a lot of people into the craft and helped us bring our skills along. So we hope the shop build goes well, and we hope there's many more years of Wood Talk Online Radio and, and oh, yeah. the free site and the guild site. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. want to uh, encourage people to join the guild and do the build-alongs. I, I haven't done one, one build-along, <laughs> um, but um, there's many times where you show something on on um, in one of your videos and I always take Todd Montana's advice and hit pause and go out and try it myself I think there's yeah. you know the second part of learning after you learn something is going off and applying it so really recommend people join the guild um, next week we'll have Matt Vanderlist we'll be at our regular time 6 p.m. Pacific uh, 9 p.m. Eastern and really quick here we will have the transcript posted and we'll put the tw- the Twitter chat transcript right in the um, closed captioning feed of the YouTube video. So if you watch this later, you can watch the video, and all the chat room activity just pops up right on top of the video. So um, one last question for you, Mark. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Any questions we should ask your buddy Matt? Oh, that's a great one. <laughs> um, ask him uh, about the the safety ramifications of woodworking in stretchy pants. <laughs> Because I'm not, I'm not quite sure that that is safe. I'm waiting for his his little beard. What do you? I don't know what you call that beard. The ZZ top. It's his uh, Captain Lou Albano beard. I'm waiting yeah, to see rubber yeah, bands Captain in Lou. it. Captain Lou, right here. Here's my Matt, here's my Matt Vanderlist. I'm waiting for that to get caught in a router or something. <laughs> yeah, and that and he and Matt likes to wear his. Um, it looks like from a uh, link from uh, the Legend of Zelda. That little hat that he wears is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, to me that's just Raider O'Reilly. Well, he used to have a Raider O'Reilly, like the knit cap with the little bill. So. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think Matt is. Uh, just make sure Matt understands that he's the unsung hero. I think of of the podcasting absolutely world. I mean, Matt was doing his own thing for quite a while before I approached him and said, "Hey, let's do wood talk together." And yeah. you know, I was like, "Hey, dude, let's uh, let's hang out. Let's be buddies." Cool. Um, he's the unsung hero of the woodworking podcasting world. So yes, he, he the guy deserves some credit. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Any final sure. thoughts, Chris or Mark? 
have your pet spayed or neutered. Um, <laughs> I, well, thanks for, for pushing things back. I really appreciate it. Um, no with, the, with the little boy around thing, my schedule has certainly changed a little bit. So um, I like yeah. to be included in the, the bath and, and reading time is mine. So story time is daddy's time. So um, I appreciate you guys pushing everything back for me. No problem. It was great to have you here. Chris? Well, thank you, guys. Yeah, great to have you, Mark. Thank you, sir. Cool. Well, that's it. That's a wrap. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to hit the end broadcast button. That'll end the Hangout, and uh, we'll get this posted online very soon. See everybody next week. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>